The idea of a Cambrian explosion is a haunt in the history of paleontology that persists in many minds to this day. Some creationists even take this as an argument against evolution, since after this event no more animal phyla emerged. This is nonsensical, because on the one hand there are younger animal phyla, on the other hand the division is not without a certain arbitrariness. There are phyla that have fewer members than some genera species. The division of animals and plants into phyla, classes, genera, and so on is the result of the attempt to organize observable nature into a system. Already in the Bible in Genesis there is a division of the animal world into aquatic animals, birds, and winged animals, land animals, reptiles and worms. In other places it is also decided which animals are clean and which are unclean. The clean animals include fish with scales, all other marine animals are considered unclean. Interestingly, the locusts were assigned to the birds and could therefore be distorted. This classification is more religious than scientific. The philosophy behind it is that there are four levels of existence, the inanimate mineral world, the living plant world, the sentient animal world and finally the spiritual human world. Quite a few still live according to this philosophy and draw arbitrary boundaries as to how one can deal with different levels. A first serious approach to the systematics of animals comes from the Greek scholar Aristotle. First of all, he recognizes two superordinate categories, the blood animals and the anemic animals, which are now referred to as vertebrates and invertebrates. Its classification of humans and some marine mammals as mammals is remarkable. On the other hand, whales and dolphins end up with the fish. But apart from this detail, you really have to praise your work. Not much happened for a long time until the famous scholar Albertus Magnus took up the topic in the High Middle Ages and organized a large number of monographs into groups, including the new group of worms. Magnus classified the animals according to their mode of movement. In the 16th century, the Zurich scholar Konrad Gessner published a five-volume history of the animals, the monographs were classified here according to locomotion, habitat, reproduction and, whenever possible, supplemented with images of the species. The fact that the classification of modern considerations does not hold up everywhere in no way diminishes the great achievement of this scholar. In 1667, Antony van Leeuwenhoek discovered a new category of living beings, the bacteria, as part of less eye-friendly microscopy sessions. So far, the microorganisms were unknown to humans. This discovery led to an unexpected expansion of the concept of life. Carl von Linn published his Systematics of Living in 1735. He defined two kingdoms, that of the plants and the animal kingdom. He divided the kingdoms into subcategories and covered a large number of species. Research gained momentum in the 18th century. It was not easy, because a still powerful church defended itself with claws against the impending loss of power. But in the end it did not succeed in stopping the sciences permanently. The science of paleontology showed that there was life that no longer exists today. Darwin developed the theory of evolution and received support from the great geologist Lyell. Lamarck developed, probably based on Lynn, a system of living beings that is still used today. The cleric Gregor Mendel in turn founded the new field of genetics. Over the years, more and more animal phyla have been discovered. Most of these strains contained worms that were previously thought of as a single block. In 1866 George Heckel introduced a third kingdom, the protists also known as unicellular organisms. These were viewed as a unit, which later turned out to be incorrect. Still, it was a significant step in the systematic exploration of life. Over time, the evolutionists came to conclusion that different tribes belong to a higher level. In the beginning, physical similarities were taken as an indication of such relationships. As complexity grew, so did the old empires, and higher level domains were introduced. The single cells were now divided into single cells without and those with a nucleus. The latter, together with plants and animals, form the domain of the eukaryotes. Finally, a third realm was established between plants and animals, 
the mushrooms. Then came the discovery of archaebacteria in the 1970s. The domain of the prokaryotes now consisted of two parts. In the end, however, it was decided that archaea and bacteria are domains rather than realms. There were now three domains. With the aid of genetic analysis, the metamodel on which the animal strains are based developed rapidly. From the isolated trunks a beautiful, relatively clear tree was formed. Of course, the variant shown is only one of many competing models, there is no absolute agreement. However, today hardly anyone doubts that all species have a common origin. In addition to studying living animals, the science of fossils also developed. Fossils have always been known and often prompted people to believe in dragons and other monsters. The church described the fossils as the whims of nature. The first mention of fossils as such can be found in Agricola, but it was precisely a respected churchman, Nicola Steno, who recognized fossils as petrified animals and plants. He was also the first to notice that certain fossils were only found in certain rock layers. He also became the founder of the science of stratigraphy. Geology continued to develop, and Giovanni Arduino divided the known geological strata into four areas, from primary to quaternary. Basically they are still valid today, they are simply called differently. Buffon was the first to venture to guess the age of the Earth. However, he lacked any useful fundamentals but based on the history of life he suspected that the Earth should be at least 75,000 years old. The father of geology, James Hutton, was also convinced of the old age of the Earth but was reluctant to give a number. Over time, researchers discovered that Arduino's system can be subdivided more finely. The first discoveries took place in the tertiary and quaternary, around 1822 the striking layers of carbon and the Cretaceous followed. Around 1830 Charles Lyell ventured a new assessment of the age of the Earth. To explain the geological processes that led to the present state, he assumed that the Earth must be several hundred million years old. He did not give a more precise number. In 1830, Robert Murchison discovered a rock structure in Wales that he called the Silurian Period. The Silurian were an ancient Celtic tribe in the area concerned and served as the namesake. Five years later, geologist Adam Sedgwick discovered a geological formation, also in Wales, which he named Cambrian, after the Latin name for Wales, Cambria. Four years later, Murchison and Sedgwick found another formation, this time in Devon, which is why the formation was also named. In 1841 Murchison was traveling, including in Russia. A formation near Perm was defined by him for a new age that was named after this city of Perm. In the same year, John Phillips calculated the age of the Earth based on the fossils to be over 98 million years. He gave the ages new names that are still in use today. A year later it began to cool between friends Sedgwick and Murchison after Murchison, based on overlapping fossils, suspected that the Cambrian was just part of the Silurian. Sedgwick was understandably not particularly fond of this. Within a few years, the former friends had nothing more to say to each other, and tragically they died before the solution to the problem was discovered. From 1856 the science of thermodynamics tried to estimate the age of the Earth. It was calculated how long it took for the hot Earth to cool down to the current level. Helmholtz came to about 20 million years ago. This value showed the big discrepancy to the geological values. Darwin suspected in his work Origin of Species based on sediments that the Earth might be 300 million years old. So next to the dispute about the ages there was also a dispute about the age of the Earth. John Phillips was not a friend of evolution but was otherwise on friendly terms with Darwin. However, he did not omit to express criticism of Darwin's work and so he re-estimated the sedimentation at 1 billion years. In 1862 the famous Lord Kelvin came to a world age of 20 to 50 million years using thermodynamic calculations. However, he also calculated the age of the Sun, which according to the thermodynamic equations could not be more than 20 million years old. In this way the thermodynamic age remained at 20 million years. In 1868, 
fossils were found for the first time that were apparently older than the previous geological time scales. Later this period was referred to as the Precambrian, so simply everything that came before the Cambrian. Finally, the geologist Charles Lapworth managed to resolve the Silurian controversy. He discovered that the overlays were in fact a new layer, which he named Ordovician after the Celtic tribe of the Ordovices. The dispute over the age of the Earth, however, continued. Darwin's son, George Darwin, calculated an age of 56 million years. In 1892 Newcomb confirms Kelvin's calculation again, the thermodynamic age remains at 20 million years. An interesting, but unfortunately overlooked, approach came from John Perry in 1895, who used a dynamic model of the Earth with a thin crust and a thick mantle and thus came to an age of 3 billion years. Finally, Kelvin did the math again, just to confirm his earlier results. The Earth is between 20 and 40 million years old. John Jolie tried to calculate the age of the Earth with the help of sediments, he came to an age between 80 million and 1 billion years. Jolie and George Darwin postulate the radioactive heating of the Earth in 1903. This shows the fundamental error in the thermodynamic calculations. The calculations were correct, but this heating source was missing. A year later, Ernest Rutherford and his assistant Boltwood dated a stone using radioactive decay and found it to be 40 million years old. This was the beginning of radioactive dating. In 1905, Boltwood dated 26 rock samples and came to an age of 92 to 570 million years, which was later corrected to 410 million to 2.2 billion years. In 1909, Charles Walcott discovered Cambrian fossils in the Burgess Formation in Canada. These finds later fueled the idea of a Cambrian explosion. A year later Arthur Holmes dated the age of a Devonian rock to 370 million years. In 1913 he dated Archean rocks to be 1.6 billion years old. He later dated the age of the Earth to 3 billion years in 1927. In 1940 he finally calculated the age of the Earth to be 4.5 billion years based on uranium decay measurements. In 1946, the Australian paleontologist Reginald Sprigg discovered multicellular fossils in the Precambrian Ediacara rock. Such fossils made it doubtful that life began with a bang in the Cambrian, but they were strange enough to be more questions than answers. In 1956 Claire Cameron Patterson determined the age of the Kenyan Diablo meteorite to be 4.55 billion years. This value for the age of the Earth is still valid today. From 1984 the fossil finds of the Chinese Chengjiang formation gain in importance, especially through the finds of the earliest vertebrates. Finally, in 2004, the Ediacaran era was introduced by the International Stratigraphy Commission. Because of its chaotic history, the idea of the Cambrian explosion has gotten into people's minds. All animal phyla are said to have been present within a short period of only 10 million years. Since this scenario seemed more and more absurd, it was preferred to replace the term with the less strict term Cambrian radiation. This is based on forerunners, but only in the aforementioned time window for reasons not specified in more detail did a massive species fold. Molecular clocks can be used to determine the last common ancestors of different species. As a result, the Cambrian explosion is completely out of the ordinary, because the groupings are at least 100 million years older. Fossils also show that multicellular organisms occurred much earlier. The sponges are up to 760 million years old and a number of genera are recorded in the Ediacaran. Nadaria and Tenophora have also been found in the Ediacaran, on the one hand through impressions of their bodies, on the other hand as part of the small shelly fauna in the form of corals. The Belateria can also be found in the Ediacaran. An interesting, but unfortunately also questioned representative is Vernon Imulcula, which seems to be the first known living being to possess the new body cavity chylome. The chylome is created by an additional folding of the embryo and forms the body tissue between the skin and the digestive tract. Depending on the way folding takes place, one speaks of a protostome and deuterostome. In a deuterostome, the original mouth takes over the function of the anus. 
the two groups Ectososo and Lophotrachozoa belong to the protostomes. The former produces, among other things, the arthropods, the latter mollusks and brachiopods. The chordates arise from the deuterostomies. Fossils are found between 560 and 540 million years ago and can be assigned to these groups with great certainty. It is more difficult with the typical representatives of the Ediacara fauna. Since there are no other approaches here, the anatomy in particular determines the classification. The Petalonami are strange creatures that anchor themselves firmly to the ground with a handle. Much has been speculated about them as to whether they are animals at all or whether they are plants. They have also been compared to modern sea feathers. In any case, they are strange, and the bilateral symmetry that was initially assumed turns out to be a fallacy, because instead of being made up of segments, they are made up of isomers that are repeatedly offset. The subgroup Charnia pushes it further and is structured fractally in up to five levels similar fern. They lived from 580 to 542 million years ago, making them one of the oldest representatives of the Ediacara fauna. Another group that is also made up of isomers are the Proarticulata. The best known here are the Dickinsonia and the Sprigina. Depending on the structure, they are divided into three main groups. As with the Petalonami, the structure and way of life of the Proarticulata remain a mystery. Certain researchers, however, see Sprigina as an ancestor of the arthropods because of its appearance. Most these creatures lived between 558 and 550 million years ago. The enigmatic Trilaboso, animals with a three-pointed symmetry, also lived at the same time. It seems nature experimented with such symmetries because there were also four and five-pointed shapes. There are few known species, but these show a wide variety of shapes. What is special is that some representatives apparently managed to survive into the Cambrian. Funazaya is an apparently worm-like organism and is also said to have been one of the first living beings to use sexuality. Particularly puzzling is Nalpenia, with the size of 30 cm a giant of its time, which shows suspicious similarities with the famous blob. Maybe the climate can explain this rise of life. The Ediacaran begins with the end of a long global glaciation. Atmospheric oxygen will exceed 10% within 30 million years. At this time the so-called embryo fossils appear. 580 and 570 million years ago, it came after two meteorite impacts, one in Churum, Oman, and Ackerman, Australia. This resulted in short-term and probably more local icing. This did not seem to harm the development of multicellular life. Towards the end of the Ediacaran, there was a drop in temperature that correlated with lower levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The binding of lime as shell and framework material in the organisms that was emerging at this time may have something to do with it. The Ediacaran ended, as it began, with icing. In contrast, the oxygen content of the atmosphere rose to 20%, which suggests increased plant activity. The temperature rose again in the Cambrian, and the oxygen reached 21%, which is comparable to today. The so-called Cambrian radiation took place during a period which, for lack of another name, is simply called stage 2. The following age offered a favorable climate. Fossils and molecular clocks clearly indicate an origin of the tribes of the Belateria in the early Ediacaran. Not only that, the animal phyla were already subdivided in this epoch. The lack of fossils is mainly due to the fact that the early animals consisted only of soft parts and that fossilization was therefore only possible in extremely fortunate cases. Even in fossil-rich epochs, only a fraction of all species has survived. There are always gaps in fossil record. The lobopods belong to the Panarthropoda within the Ectasoso. Fossils show that they split into two different groups as early as the late Ediacaran. The first representatives of both main groups appeared before the Cambrian radiation. Nevertheless, it can be seen here that both Onychophora and Dinocoridida developed in the course of this radiation. The Rhodiodonts developed particularly rich in species and in the later Cambrian they became the top predators like Anomalocaris. But this success was not sustainable, already towards the end of the Cambrian the lobopods lost their importance, 
very few closely related ones survived to our time. The sister clan of the lobopods is the arthropods. Today this group includes crabs, arachnids, centipedes, millipedes, and of course the insects. On the other hand, the Marellomorpha occurring in the Cambrian are extinct. The rise of this group took place after the Cambrian radiation, they were also marginalized soon afterwards, and the last representative disappeared in the Quaternary. All arthropods living today belong to the group of Schizoramia. The first group of the Schizoramia are the Trilobites, the Arachnids, and the Crabs. The Nectospidida were close to the Trilobites and died out in the later Cambrian. The common ancestors of crabs and arachnids are similar to the trilobites, but in the course of the Cambrian radiation they changed their blueprint and became rich in species. The arachnids later spawned eurypterids, horseshoe crabs, and of course the spiders. In the case of crustaceans, besides crustaceans, it is mainly insects that later became more important. The trilobites are divided into trilobite-like and true trilobites, which together form the class Pantrilobita. The trilobites were early forms that emerged in the course of Cambrian radiation, but whose roots go back to the Ediacaran. There are approaches to derive them from early arthropods such as Parvancorina. However, these groups were not granted for a long time, they died out again in the Cambrian. The trilobites were more successful. If one can get the impression of a Cambrian explosion in a group, it is the trilobites. Their evolution got going after the said period and by the end of the Cambrian they became the dominant group. No other group could match them in terms of biodiversity. This success continued into the Ordovician, then the balance of power began to turn in favor of another successful group, the Mollusks. The Mollusks and the Brachiopods, which also belong to the Lophotrachozoa, now seem to be less affected by the Cambrian radiation. Both groups can be traced back to the Ediacaran in both fossil and molecular form. Even before the Cambrian radiation, the mollusks split into the current classes of snails, mussels, and cephalopods. There was also the class Sachitida, which only existed in the Cambrian and produced some particularly interesting representatives. The ancestors of the mussels were rather snail-like and the position of Cinella is not certain. In any case, mollusks made up a not negligible proportion of the small shelly fauna. Mollusks were important even before Cambrian radiation, but the cephalopods only began their development in this context. Only then did the brachiopods bloom. The hemichordata belong to the deuterostoma and are a sister group of the chordata. They are strange worm-like organisms which today occupy a rather marginal position. But in the Cambrian this was quite different. There are legacies of the groups living today, but more important are their colony-forming relatives, the Graptolites. The Hemichordata have been found in the earliest Cambrian, but the radiation began well after the so-called Cambrian radiation. Up until the end of the Cambrian, the Graptolites in particular developed. These are best known as reliable markers for stratigraphy. But their time did not last long, and they disappeared into the lower Devonian. Finally we come to our animal line, the Chordata. Evidently, confirmed by molecular clocks, these have already split up in the Ediacaran. At the beginning of the Cambrian, the Cephalochordata, to which today's lancet fish belongs, as well as the tunicates and vertebrates, which were already fossilized in the Ediacaran, appear. Most of these animals are not long known and were discovered in the Chinese deposits. The conodonts alone had been known for a long time, but it took a long time before their place in the system could be assigned. They arose before Cambrian radiation and survived until the end of the Triassic. One of the oldest groups were the Saccharidida but died out as early as the Cambrian. The Vetulicolida are another strange subgroup of the vertebrates. In summary, no real influence of Cambrian radiation can be seen in our group either. At the end of the Cambrian, the trilobites clearly dominated, they made up about 80% of the total population of the Belateria. The mollusks and brachiopods alone were still relatively species-rich, the other groups seem insignificant. Actually, therefore it is only justified to speak of radiation in the case of the trilobites. Towards the end of the Ordovician, mollusks, especially the nautiloids, dominated as top predators. 
At the beginning of the Silurian this role was contested and removed from them by the Eurypterids. The Piscean Age did not begin until the Devonian. But towards the end of the Devonian, the fish lost their importance and the tetrapods rose. The Graptolites also disappeared in the Devonian, towards the end of the Carboniferous only one species of trilobite survived, which was able to last until almost the end of the Permian. What left? The Cambrian radiation was probably far less meaningful than previously propagated. The fact that we know little about the time before is related to the circumstances of the fossilization. It was not until the end of the Ediacaran that various organisms began using the mineral waste products to build scaffolding, armor, and shells. In many cases we only have snapshots. We are aware of the larger relationships through the molecular clock, but unfortunately the values provided are burdened with great uncertainty. The better a story can be substantiated by fossils, the easier it is to calibrate the molecular clock. The gaps do not arise because there was nothing there, but because no relevant finds have yet been made. It is also not easy to find sites for every age. As we have seen, our knowledge is still young, we know the age of the Earth barely 80 years, and many fossils, especially the interesting finds from China, are discoveries from the last 30 years. And the possibility of dating using molecular clocks is probably even more recent. With such a jumble of developments, it is only logical that myths arise that are often very persistent. And a particularly persistent myth is that of the Cambrian explosion. I thank everyone who has bravely watched and listened so far, and I apologize if I have bored you. I wish you all a Merry Christmas and stay froggy.